All right, guys. Welcome to the third installment of Morning Report Emergency Medicine. I'm Alec Weir. Let's go ahead and get started. This is the case of Frozen. A 55-year-old man is brought in by EMS first thing in the morning. He's been found sleeping outside, and as he rolls by you on the gurney, he's moving and moaning spontaneously. But, by the way, it's the middle of February. His heart rate's 38, his blood pressure's 110 over 60, respiratory rate of 19, setting well on room air, and you, you just can't get a temperature with your tympanic thermometer, but he feels cold on exam. Patient's speaking, but it's incoherent. He's localizing to pain. He opens his eyes spontaneously, which puts him at a GCS of about 11. He's bradycardic on exam. He's defecated on himself, but you don't see any signs of external trauma. So what do you want to do? Well, let's get that full set of vitals, right? Let's get that temperature. Want to do a sepsis evaluation, get blood cultures, a urine, chest x-ray, get a CT head because he's altered. And while you're putting those orders in, you get handed your EKG. And here's what you get. You see we've got a regular rhythm, but it's slow. Uh, don't really see any P waves. And we've got ST depression sort of diffusely. And then what is this? Is this ST elevation? Is this a right bundle branch block? But it's in almost all the leads. What do we have here? We have an Osborne wave, right? Also known as a J wave. This is where you have J point elevation. In almost all of your leads, you actually have negative deflection in AVR and V1. And when we see this, we think hypothermia, right? But not necessarily. It is not pathognomonic for hypothermia. It can be a normal variant. It can be a sign of hypercalcemia. It can be secondary to medications, as well as a, a cardiac finding of a neurologic insult. So here again, you see we have this J-point elevation diffusely. Except for AVR and V1, we have negative deflection. And this poor baseline you see is actually shivering artifact. So how are we going to get that temperature? We can use a rectal thermometer. We could use a bladder temperature probe or an esophageal temperature probe. And on our patient, we, when we finally got that temperature, it was 27 degrees Celsius. So he's hypothermic. For hypothermia, you have to beware of the predisposing factors, things that decrease heat production. These are your hypopituitarisms, your myxedema, your hypoglycemias. Beware of the things that increase heat loss. These are patients with eczema, your burn patients, or alcohol consumption, or things that impair te temperature regulation. Things like basal or skull fractures, chronic subdural hematomas, Parkinson's disease, and even certain medications, especially your antipsychotics and your antidepressants. And not only do you have to beware of the predisposing factors, you have to beware of the precipitating factors, things like sepsis, MI, pancreatitis, trauma, and even cerebrovascular disease. And here's a big list of some of the symptoms of hypothermia. And I want to draw your attention to one of them here, and that's the dysrhythmia. And that's usually ventricular fibrillation. All right, more commonly after thir when you get to a temperature below 32 degrees Celsius. And now we have the Swiss staging of hypothermia used by our wilderness medicine colleagues. If you don't have access to a thermometer, you can sort of use your clinical symptoms to gauge what stage of hypothermia you're at and also what your core temperature is. And as you can see for our patient, based on physical exam as well as temperature, he's right in this stage 2 to 3 area. So, they're cold. Let's fix it. We can do external rewarming. This is for patients with mild hypothermia. Or we can do core rewarming. This is for patients with cardiovascular instability or a temperature less than 32 or failure of external rewarming. So how do we do external rewarming? You can do it with warm blankets, increasing the air temperature in the room, or by forced air warming blankets, things like the bear hugger. But if that doesn't work, core rewarming, right? You can start with warm IV fluids. You can use the central venous temperature management that for us is the Alceus catheter. You can do airway rewarming with warm air through your endotracheal tube peritoneal lavage with warm IV fluids into one port and uh, with removal of that fluid from a second. Same with thoracic lavage, warm IV fluids through one chest tube and removal through a second. In theory, this should be done on the right side because there is a possible increased risk of ventricular fibrillation when you do thoracic lavage on the left side of the chest. You can do it with extracorporeal blood rewarming, ECMO, if your hospital has those capabilities. You do want to avoid nasogastric lavage for warming as it can cause electrolyte imbalances. So when is cold and dead dead and dead? 
Your defibrillator is unlikely to work at less than 30 degrees Celsius, but there have been no proven indicators for resuscitation termination. Things that have been looked at are potassium greater than 10 to 12, fibrinogen less than 50, or ammonia greater than 250. And those are some pretty extreme lab values. But sometimes cold and dead is dead and dead, okay? So you can use your clinical judgment in these resuscitations. What are our take home points? Get that temperature, all right? If they feel cold, be, you need to look at other options for getting a temperature if your tympanic thermometers aren't cutting it. Beware of the precipitating as well as the predisposing conditions that come along with hypothermia. Be wary of your cardiac and respiratory effects, mainly that ventricular fibrillation, which is, becomes more common at less than 32 degrees Celsius. And when it comes to rewarming, be aggressive, all right? If external rewarming isn't working, get in there and do internal rewarming, either by warmed air, central venous monitoring, thoracic lavage, peritoneal lavage. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Keep your eyes open for those interesting cases, and as always, I appreciate the feedback.